Nature abounds in symbiosis. Many species depend on a partner for their very survival. A grouper enjoys a cleaning as tiny shrimp eat the parasites on its skin. Anemones give safe harbor to clownfish who bring food and chase off predators. With nectar and pollen, flowers entice birds and bees to help fertilize them. Most plants rely on fungi living on their roots to extract nutrients from the soil. And grazing animals could not digest their diet without the bacteria that live in their gut and break down plant matter. We too are symbiotic creatures. Beneficial bacteria cover every inch of our skin and the length of our intestines. They help digest food, produce vitamins, and keep dangerous microbes out. Symbiosis has deep roots in the history of life. Some 50 to 60 million years ago, just after the age of the dinosaurs, two species formed a lasting bond here in the dense thicket that would become the Amazonian rainforest. A big mature at a nest. These huge mounds of earth are the product of that partnership. One that brought Ted Schulz and Ulrich Mueller to a remote corner of Brazil. The unlikely excavators of all this dirt are leaf cutter ants. Look, they're bringing stuff in there. There's some forges here. Mm -hmm. Starting. Yeah. Leaf cutter ants make their nests in underground chambers. They emerge regularly to forage, blazing trails that extend hundreds of feet into the forest. Most tropical plants are permeated with toxic chemicals, a deterrent against browsers. The ants cut fresh vegetation, but they don't eat it. They feed it to another organism. Foragers carry their cargo down into the nest and turn it over to smaller worker ants. They clean the leaf fragments and chew them into a pulpy mulch. Leaf cutters cultivate a fungus that breaks down the toxins in the leaves and swells with proteins and sugars. This is the ant's food. Both the ants and the cultivated fungus are dependent on each other for living. The ants need the fungus as a food they're dependent on it, you take away the fungus, they will die. In reverse, the fungus cannot do without the ants. So it's a mutual codependency. A mature colony of leafcutter ants can consist of as many as 8 million individuals, and they're the dominant herbivores of the New World tropics. They take an estimated 15 to 20 percent of all the fresh vegetation. A mature colony of Atta leafcutter ants are the equivalent of an adult cow sitting in the middle of the rainforest um, foraging on the vegetation in their immediate area. The entire rainforest is affected by the symbiosis of ant and fungus. To understand how it evolved, Schultz and Mueller collect ant nests throughout Latin America. Here's one. Where? Oh, yeah. An experienced eye can spot the subtle signs of a young nest, founded perhaps six months ago when a new queen left home with a bit of fungus in her mouth and burrowed into the ground. Mm, there, there it is. Beautiful. Opening a nest is a very exciting moment. Suddenly the cavity opens and you see the fungus garden and then you may see the queen. There's the queen. Yeah. There she is. Mm -hmm. The size of a peanut. 
What we've learned from studying the ants is that you can have a long-term existence over 50 million years as an agriculturist. There's clear parallels between the ant agriculture and human agriculture. Both types of societies are dependent on cultivation of some other organism and have very sophisticated procedures how to promote the growth of these organisms. But human farmers are plagued by pests in their crops, while the ants' gardens seemed pest-free. A century of research had concluded that the ants are probably so adept at weeding that no infestation can take hold. A graduate student in 1998, Cameron Curry just didn't buy it. I actually had uh, some people tell me that uh, looking at diseases in the ant gardens was, was kind of a, a silly project, that the ants maintain their gardens free of diseases, and so why would you be going there to look for diseases? So I went out and collected ant colonies and then I isolated pieces of the garden uh, to see what was there other than the fungus the ants cultivated. He cultured 1,500 fungus samples, and the same aggressive mold kept showing up. When he removed the ants from a nest, he saw the mold devastate the fungus in a matter of days. So the ants did have a pest in their gardens. But how did they keep it so completely under control? Cameron began to wonder about a white, waxy coating on the body parts of some ants. What really intrigued him were the ants working deep in the gardens that were covered with the stuff. He asked the experts about it. In the past, people had just considered this to be some sort of nondescript secretion that was produced by the ants for unknown, probably uninteresting reasons. And Cameron was the first to put this waxy secretion on the under the microscope and noticed it was not inert, and lifeless, but it was actually alive. The wax turned out to be tangled mats of bacteria. But what shocked Cameron was these were the same types of bacteria that produce half the antibiotics used in human medicine. I remember my graduate advisor and I were laughing, thinking that um, wouldn't this be exciting if these ants have been effectively using these bacteria for production of antibiotics for millions of years, when humans only discovered this 60 years ago, and, and uh, we thought at the time that this was maybe a bit far-fetched. Far-fetched, but true. It seems the ants have been using antibiotics to control the pest in their gardens for some 50 million years. So why hasn't the mold evolved antibiotic resistance? I think that the answer probably lies in the fact that the ants are using cultures of millions of cells of bacteria to produce these antibiotics. And so these bacteria are evolving. Likewise, the uh, pathogen that is the target of these antibiotics is also evolving. And it's an evolutionary arms race that has continued for 50 million years. And so the symbiosis of ant and fungus also includes the aggressive mold in the fungus garden and the bacteria living on the ants. Nature is often more complex than it first appears. Scientists have just begun to understand how two species can interact, or three, or four. But they're a long way from understanding how thousands or tens of thousands of species can interact to create the monumental ecosystems of the world like rainforest and coral reefs. And the most remarkable gap in our knowledge is in bacteria and other microorganisms. Because these make up the base of the living world. We need them, and they don't need us. And yet, we do everything in our power to avoid microbes. A barrage of new products states the message loud and clear. The only good germ is a dead one.